Uh, so it's interesting because the, the history of, of artificial intelligence, the trajectory of it, is not going to happen in, in, our, in our public spaces. You know, we, have, we see these images from Blade Runner all the time. We see this, like, uh, this kind of post-human civilization. And it's always in the public space. It's happening already right now uh, on our kitchen table. This is the Amazon, I don't know what they call it, Echo these days. They always put it next to a coffee machine. You know? They always put it in the kitchen, in our domestic sphere. And it's dressed in different ways. You know, It's almost approaching this kind of idea of, of human. You can wear different dresses. And there's, there's some startling data. Uh, 39 mil million Americans own a smart speaker. That's one out of six of Americans. 65% can't imagine going back to the days before. 42% say that's essential to their lives. I mean, this is crazy. This is uh, data from NPR. Uh, in 2022, half, more than half, 55% of all US households will have smart speakers. And more and more, um, people are using it to control their homes for, for smart automation. So this is the Apple iPod, just I, I home. No, what's it called? I don't even know. But anyway, this is the uh, Amazon's um, competitor, the Apple device. And what's interesting is they try to make it soft. They try to make it blend into the environment, like that it always belongs there. But inside, it's a supercomputer. In inside of that Amazon Echo, it's actually a machine. Um, so dressing this up is very interesting. So our project is this. You, you might have seen the doll when you walk in. Um, the, it, it's basically a smartphone. If you take apart a smartphone and put lights on it, it can be this kind of next generation AI. And I'll go into this a little bit more. So to make this AI, we have all the components, all the, all the abilities all around the site near GDP. Here's GDP, and here's the Tongdenlun um, toy and stationary market. A lot of you know this, it's kind of a decrepit block. But we have Changshindong, which has a lot of fabric manufacturing. We have this a traditional market, the largest uh, traditional market in Seoul. We have, of course, we have retailers in Tongdenlun, but we also have electronics. So if you combine all these abilities, you could actually make amazing things. And it's, it's a kind of untapped potential of the city. So here's some street views with the kind of uh, the toy station market. Not very nice right now, but very dense. But you also have really old Hanok from 1930s. Uh, but you have antique markets still selling Michael Jackson records in perfect condition uh, right across the way. Um, we have like the, the electronics markets in Stalin, but also the, the garment factories. So amazing abilities in this area. What if we can combine them? So this idea of combination comes from making this conve conveyor belt. You, you keep all the existing buildings. You keep all the manufacturing potential, but you put a conveyor belt so this whole block of micro factories and, and residences can act as one urban entity. So you have these individual entities, but you have one, potentially one large uh, manufacturing system through this conveyor belt. And the way we located the conveyor belt is through historical lines. There used to be a stream that ran along this line that dumped into the uh, a Chungchen, uh, I'm sorry, Chungchen. There also used to be a railroad there. So the conveyor belt basically follows these lines and, and reconfigures them um, to, in a kind of re urban regeneration project. So here's the old stream. It's been recovered into a new ecology. And through putting in this pedestrian um, uh, system, then you have uh, you can actually use these mixed-use buildings in a much more fluid way. You can use these residential buildings that are existing on site, the factories. But the conveyor belt runs through the back of the house, and you can have this kind of uh, customization happening in real time. These are some, just some you know, potentials of the conveyor belt going through factories, going between buildings, going underneath mixed use, um, uh, going inside storage containers. These are all existing buildings on, on this, um, this area. And, and so when, around the south side where the railroad tracks were, we're actually proposing the conveyor belt to be covered over so that all these micro factories can work as one, one unit. And these are just some images. Here's that, here's that uh, conveyor belt scooting through. Um, but at, at the corner where it turns the corner, there's a new building in a parking lot, which, which is, could be a kind of design center, somewhere where the community can come together and really think about the future of this area. So it's, it's very optimistic. But we also need a dark side. We always need a dark side to every story. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a very, the, this cartoon was, uh, actually most of the work was done by Payne Kim. Can you raise your hand? Payne Kim. She is, 
She's going to recently or soon graduate from my from my lab. She graduated from SNU a couple years ago, last year. But she is pursuing um, her her own uh, trajectory, doing um, architectural illustration. So this, in a way, this is her debut tonight. So she did um, all these amazing drawings. But the, the story is, is very interesting. We used this, this cartoon to actually express this idea of the toy and stationary market, the, the, the essence of that area. But um, it, it, it tells a kind of narrative of the potential. So it, it, the, just to summarize the story, there's this kind of father. We don't know why he's a single father. Maybe, maybe the mother died. Um, maybe there's some other occasion. But he's, he's distracted. He's, he's one of these kind of genius fathers and he, he's not very good at taking care of his daughter. And, and, but what's interesting is, is uh, he cares about her a lot, so he, he tries more and more to kind of engage her in other ways and to take care of her in other ways. So he explores these um, areas and begins to put together this AI. I love that the phone is going off too. This is good. Thank you. <laughs> um, ex explore these areas and begin to assemble a, a kind of a doll that can begin to talk and begin to respond, but it's not enough. He's driven more and more and compelled more and more um, to give more and more sentience to this thing. So he make, ends up making this product, um, which her friends love. She loves this product. So he, he realizes he's got to make more. Starts a business. He, he goes to local design offices. This is in Palakdo, right next door, but there's these design offices. He hires different skins. He makes different clothes for her. Goes to Seoul and Sangha. Uh, interfaces with the electronic markets, making parts. And uh, this is a little ad that runs in the story. All of a sudden you have um, basically a, a home automation device that can walk around. It's a doll, uh, made right, uh, mass customized right on our site. But what it can do, once you add internet to it, it can be its own daycare. Through the TV, all the parents can interface. You can watch the kids. You know, this kid is telling its secrets. It also has sense of smell, so if there's a fire or if there's bad air, it protects from allergies. So it does all these things that are so great um, and, and, and uh, you know, has a kind of protecting role. But, um, and also, of course, the businesses are skyrocketing in this area. You know, everyone wants this thing. Uh, there's, this, there's a kind of handshake between the AI potential and humans. There's, there's this moment. Uh, and interesting enough that the, the Star of the, story, the main character does a lecture, and these parents are talking and say, "Well, do we need this? You know, safety is first. They check off the box. We've all checked off this box. Whenever we download an app, we basically sell our soul <laughs> to the telecom company or whatever. It's saying you can have my data, you can have me, basically. So everyone checks this box when they buy Daisy. It's called uh, uh, what does Daisy stand for? Pain." Daycare Artificial Intelligence System. Whatever they buy, this, it's a great name. She thought of this. So, um, uh, whenever they buy Daisy, they have to check off this box and say, yes, you can have my data. Imagine the incredible amount of data you get from, from raising your kids. And then, so the last frame is a little bit dark. You see the, the president of this telecom company walking through these, in, uh, these servers. She's looking over our site. Uh, and she and she's kind of mutters, everyone is safe tonight. You know, what does this mean? You know, it, it, is she controlling this data? So it's asking this question, even though we have incredible abilities of customization, even though we have a very optimistic <coughs> urban proposal for the way things can become very locally manufactured, once you hook in systems of, of data, does that locality disappear? That's the, that's the main question of this project. And interestingly enough, just for this last slide, this is the SK Telecom complex of buildings. Here's here's Helen Sangha and here's our site over here. So in a way this this our site not only has very local businesses but it also has the kind of uh, the corporate structure sort of potentially spine maybe. So this question is the way we end the end this uh, project. Thank you so much for listening and uh, give an introduction of the background for this project. Uh, my name is Rafael Luna, that's the person who got introduced me, and I'll be presenting the Seoul Production School, so the site being in Seoul. And 
basically to present this, I wanted to yeah, go over the, the background of what uh, led to the interest in this project. Uh, there was a, recently this article, uh, Bloomberg Technologies, that uh, was entitled, The US Drops Out of the Top 10 in Innovation Rankings, uh, which as a world news, I guess they use the, the US dropping as a method to bring you in into the article. But the interesting thing that goes unnoticed, it's not that the US dropped out of 10, but we, we see South Korea as the number one, taking the top spot in the world as the most innovative country. Um, of course, this is based on Bloomberg Technologies, but it is uh, very significant. Um, and it's no surprise that South Korea has risen in innovation uh, when it is a country that focuses on education as a background for building human capital. Uh, recently, there's a book uh, entitled Why Countries Fail by a British economist named uh, James Robinson that explains um, <laughs> Basically, the innovation comes from countries or cities or towns uh, having inclusive economies as much as inclusive political systems. One of these inclusive uh, systems that Korea, it's not just Seoul, but Korea thrives in is the educational system, which is a very strong social infrastructure for the country. Sadly enough, this same push for having a very educated human capital has pushed itself to be thrown out of the social infrastructure and have families seek public, I mean private education over public education. So we start seeing these numbers drop, like elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, you know, from four million to two million students uh, of students, you know, they're still getting educated. They're just opting to go into a private system rather than the very strong public system that the government was uh, providing. So it's a very strong social infrastructural network that it's somewhat becoming underutilized. And what does this pose as an you know urban artifact in the city? Well, if this is a system, I'm using uh, as an example a block in Up Young as a typical example where these things occur. We start seeing if we map out all the elementary schools and public schools that yes, it is a system in social infrastructure. It's replicated uh, certain radiuses around uh, the different neighborhoods in order for everybody to has, have access to it. Some of these schools are actually starting to close because of the lack of student population. And if these are distributed throughout Seoul, that means that we'll eventually start having large urban voids. So what do we do with these large urban voids? And how can we maintain this very strong social infrastructure that we have as uh, education? And then I think building up on uh, what Nina was bringing up is, what is the future of education in the city? Do we still need these systems? Should it be more and more open way of learning? Um, I mean, we all learn how to repair anything from YouTube. So do we even need institutions? So maybe these institutions can start changing and hybridizing uh, in a way that we can start learning from production, learning from uh, even AI, learning from uh, all these online free platforms. So what I'm proposing that we look at is not knocking down these buildings, but actually through parasitic hybrids, we can start revamping them, uh, injecting them with new programs so that we maintain this system, but as a system of the future of future learning. Um, and I think of this as a life cycle that we can inject into these buildings, uh, starting with the learning as a component for it. So we maintain the learning, but we need to kind of rethink what that means um, in these new systems. Again, uh, free online education, open for anybody from a, you know, a one-year-old learning uh, sign language to an adult as a continuing education. Uh, this could lead to teaching them about production and production on site so that you can become your own manufacturer. You can live on the site so that you always have access to all of these things then what happens with the things that you produce? You need to consume them, sell them, or buy them on site. Um, 
you need uh, spaces for organization, meaning you know, how do you teach people to organize a business, uh, form corporations, form alliances. Um, also socializing, how does meeting other people, events like these come into play in that factor of learning. And of course, exhibiting, getting the word out, uh, exposing yourself to other uh, people and cultures. Uh, this is not like one, two, three, even though I number them one, two, three, four, five. It could go either way as long as we have a life cycle where all of these things operate and get transformed into architectural typologies that start creating a 3D block where you not only work at a ground level but you start operating at certain or different vertical levels uh, and you start integrating them all in a block uh, that gets infilled with this density of the life cycle. So we see the old structure being eaten up by these parasitic pods that are living units that get injected like a skewer that brings you into all of these social uh, buildings and open up into different scales of urban plazas, again to have the openness of not just people as residents to live in the block but integrating the whole neighborhood um, so in, in plan, you can see the almost this being in, the cycle being interpreted as architecture as well, where you can walk through the whole building. And how do you manifest these uh, forms of production and education into the public space? Maybe the, even the living pods can be part of this uh, robotics that they get built up as you move into the block. The pots themselves, the way that we live, can start changing so that we can start being innovative and productive even when in our own homes. Of course, these are micro units. So how can you have these spaces where you have the freedom to um, always be thinking and trying out new things, and then after you're done, you still have your pub, uh, private space and uh, you're done for the day. Uh, <coughs> I apologize that even though for a Korean living he kept his shoes on, <laughs> so uh, gotta, we got to redo that rendering. Um, but again, from the micro unit to the large urban scale, the life cycle can continue where you have living and producing and uh, learning all within the, again, from the multiple scales. Right? Thank you. Some of you guys know I, I do things on uh, Pyongyang, although I'm not from there. But for some reason, I've, I've been doing this for, for some years. So, uh, so we, we tried to uh, uh, somehow propose something related to this theme, uh, Factory for Urban Living in Pyongyang as well. Not that I'm saying that I have a client there, but uh, I wish. But uh, uh, hoping that uh, one day they, when, when, they, uh, when they open up more, when they open up the economy more to the market economy, probably there are, uh, there are ways that, that we can contribute to, to, to that nation. So, uh, it seems they're gonna talk, right? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but uh, they say in May, but I'm still not sure. I, I'm, I know that some of some of you are bothered by these people. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have warned you that I have a photo of a Trump. But um, so uh, whatever they 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 do and. Apparently, it seems that they are they are gonna there are gonna be some changes in this peninsula, and maybe that's what we're hoping, right? But in fact, the the conception that we always had in this uh, North Korea is that that it's all about I don't know like problematic nation uh, with all these uh, military threats or even some sort of. Uh, outdated or um, far be, uh, behind the, the average lives, lives of, of other civilized countries. 
So basically, that's something that we always have in mind when we think of North Korea. But in fact, uh, things are changing, no matter whether the political system or the, the, the regime are changing, um, the, the actual society is uh, changing, or it has been changed. Uh, so they started to adopt all these market economy systems. There, there are street vendors. There, there are big department stores, that, which we haven't thought about it, uh, seeing, it, seeing them in Pyongyang, right? So that's what's happening now. Uh, no, matter, no, matter, no matter whether we see it or not, it is happening. So that's somewhat the, the, the argument that I wanted to, to make. And aside, aside from all these uh, economic changes, we see all these uh, new residential developments coming in. So if, if you think about this, I mean, obviously you can bring in your political point of view to, to this project saying that, oh, uh, they built it because of whatever, to strengthen the, the, the idea of the regime or idea of the, their Chuche ideology, whatever, but still uh, it is happening. And uh, the reason why I think they're happening is because there are more people that uh, basically they, they, they do business with, uh, with other countries uh, such as China or uh, some uh, southeastern Asia. So there are more people with money. And when, when you have more people with money in the nation, you basically have to fulfill their demand, right? So, so it's not about uh, socialist, it's not about communist, it's about uh, making, making those uh, new middle class being satisfied with the regime, right? So that's what's happening. And when I see that, uh, I, I felt a bit, uh, I don't know, disappointed because they used to have a very interesting system called micro district, which composes or which becomes the uh, main unit or basic unit to compose the city, right? So the micro district, depending on the the sizes of the city, micro unit, uh, micro district is always the basic unit that, that forms the size of the neighborhood, and then it grows to the city. So that's what they had. And in fact, it, it is very similar similar to our apartment Danji, right? We all know apartment Danji, so it's not that hard to explain what this is about. So you have obviously residentials, but you have all these, uh, let's say, child care, schools, and uh, civics, and uh, let's say, uh, some service amenities or uh, stores. You, you have all these things all together in one district, right? So that's uh, what Apatitanji is, and also what micro district is. The big difference is that, that they have factory or the production area in it. Because as you know, the in the idea of socialist, or in the idea of socialism, the, everybody has to uh, work on some sort of production. So, so in that sense, they they try to embed all these uh, either uh, uh, cottage industries or home uh, uh, workshops. They they apply the uh, their idea into the district. Then the in the uh, so that had that made the the whole economic system quite sustainable. So when this uh, Michihiro Mimura, who's the, the professional uh, economic, uh, economist on North Korea, when he was asked that, oh, uh, there, there's been sanction for a while on North Korea, uh, but how could, how could they survive uh, so throughout this sanction? And uh, what he observed was that there's, uh, I'll just read the quote. Ten different families have ten different ways of making money. For example, a wife has a talent for making clothes or cookies or cakes. She starts providing those services and products to people in her neighborhood. That household business starts at a very small scale, just selling to her neighborhoods individually. But through, through word of mouth, she gets more customers, she, so she, her business grows. She needs help. Officially, she cannot hire the help she needs. Officially, that's forbidden. But if she works together with a group of wives in her building, 
that's acceptable. In if one wife hires nine others, that's illegal explo exploitation. But if ten wives work together, that's socialist cooperation. So basically, this is the way how they sustain the neighborhood. Basically, they make things in local, and then they work uh, work in local, and then they sell it local. If you sell it to other city, that's illegal. But if you sell it to the, the in, within the district, that's legal, and that, that's how they make the the, the sustaining uh, unit. So basically, this is the way how they uh, start to bring in some ideas of market economy within this micro district. So it, it is quite interesting system, and it is interesting to develop further, uh, considering what's happening in our in our society in um, in these days. But it, the the fact is. Uh, maybe uh, North Korea itself doesn't know the, the, the pros or the advantages of this idea. And they, what they are doing is all these, let's say, new real estate type developments in the city. So they, they're not building any micro districts anymore. So they're, they're building just high rise towers with uh, some commercials, but not with all these social amenities. So that, that's how, uh, that's where our project has started. So the, the location of the project is there on the east side, uh, where all the <coughs> micro districts are. And on the left, you see the Kim Il-sung Plaza with uh, Kim il the grand uh, people's house. And uh, you have Ju Chet Tower. You, you see the shadow. So our side is over there, where it has been reconstructed, uh, reconstructed mostly in the 60s. So uh, as you can see, uh, it's a mega block. It's um, almost uh, 250 meter by 400 meters. So what they do ha have is that they have a, a residential at the perimeter of the block, and then another layers of residential inside because it, it is quite a big block. But then the, there are small, uh, small let's say workshops or 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 the, the, the cottage factories uh, in the middle. So we we try to, by the way, I have, I have to credit uh, this work to Eugene, uh, who's behind. Uh, she, she did a, a tremendous amount of work for this. So our idea is to make this kind of uh, the, the physical module into our project so it becomes more modular. So, so when, we make a module within the blog that could give us some uh, flexibility when, when we have to deal with different sides of the, the blocks. So anyway, so that module is composed with res residentials around and production in the middle. So these are all different type of, uh, like, let's say, module typologies with uh, different production facilities. And this is how it's composed. You'll see in the exhibition. And this is uh, how the unit works uh, in different scales of uh, the production. And eventually, in the last slide, eventually, what we are uh, thinking is that when we, when they start to embed this idea uh, in the in the, the the area scale, the city scale, there can be relationship between the, these blocks that. Okay, this blog is mainly focusing on, let's say, fashion production, and the other blog is mainly focused on the other production. So then they can kind of substitute each other and or help each other, support each other. So that was the idea of the, the project. Thank you.
And this is how it looked like before, and that was the, uh, the temple within that area. <coughs> and this is how it looks like now, because it was uh, designated as a uh, historic history in 2000, the year 2000. So most of the old buildings are uh, preserved, but somehow they are abandoned uh, due, due to the inflexible uh, urban regeneration uh, regulations. So you can see in the map, this is the old street with all the historic buildings. And this is the uh, fabric market. It was the street vendors and the building was built in uh, 1980s. So it's a big building and with some um, fabric mass markets inside. So it's on the second floor, there are all like textile and all the fabric related materials. And on the fourth floor, you can see these like small stations that uh, the ladies can sew your, uh, uh, sew the things you need with the fabric you buy downstairs. So they are like measure uh, suits and things like that. And this is the temple we saw in the photo earlier. And you can see other supplies related to fabric uh, produ production within this area. So this is what, where we propose our design. It's within the Dabochi district, but outside of the main historic uh, street. So there are a lot of uh, unused land like this. There are like four, uh, four to five uh, building lots. So we take them as a typical site and try to propose uh, like a social living working units for them. So we started thinking how the fashion or fabric related work can do or can live together. So there are like different type of uh, garments we wear now that's ready to wear or meant to measure and the highest uh, level is the peaceful. So the ready to wear is what we buy today. It's uh, mass production and it comes with different sizes different uh, styles, but you can customize it. And to the second one is the metal measure suits. So it's uh, like 30% custom made. If they have, uh, they will take your, uh, they, they will take measure of your like your neck or your length of your arm or how your waist. <coughs> but basically they, you have to pick some typical type of um, style. And they are product in the same uh, factory as the ready to wear. And the highest uh, level of the suits is 100% custom made, it's feasible. Everything is uh, made, made for your, uh, made for, it's designed for you so you can customize in everything. And what we propose here is made to wear. It's a, like, a bit like co-creation with the designers. They will make some shape that's uh, uh, designed by the designers, but you can pick the colors, pick the styles, and with the assistance of the 3D, uh, the, of the digital machines, you can have the different pattern making, and you can have uh, metal wear uh, garments. So that's how typical Obama was made. First, you do the pattern making, and then you do the fabric dividing, and these two, uh, and then you do the sewing, overlapping, ironing, fitting, and finally the photo shooting. For these three steps, you need bigger space, a big table to do the patterns or dividing the fabrics and iron your uh, products. And for these two steps. You can have individual stations, and you might need a private space to do your sewing and overlapping. 
and these two step, uh, these two steps are back and forth. You need like more time here, and after that you can go to a fitting room to try if the final garment is fit, and then do the photo shooting, and then go online or to the product uh, catalog. So from the making uh, progress, we are thinking maybe we can bring different kind of uh, fashion, uh, fashion related uh, workers into this building using, using these three type of uh, units. Uh, the first one is combine the residential manufacturing and the commercial. It's a bit like, a, it's a bit similar to the street housing, Da Lao Chen. So it's like a two or three floors house and you have the first floor and second floor for the uh, commercial. And then have the, you have your own studio on the second floor and the living space on top. Or you can have the second type. It's residential and, uh, and manufacturing. It's for more like uh, individual designers or um, some mature uh, designers. They, have, they already have their own a business, they can do their manufacturing here and then sell at some other place. Or just simply have the residential unit things within the building. So for our, for the whole uh, condominium, we have two unit A, which is the one similar to the street house. And four single suites for the, uh, individual designers that they already have their own business or they are more like a stylist, they can have their own, um, they can sell their product or it's more like a private service. And some apartment unit that's for a young, for some innovative entrepreneur, they try to start, start up their new business together and uh, six single rooms for like uh, graduate, just like new designer or students just graduate from school. They want a space to live, but they can share the fashion factory together. So as you can see from the aerial view, that's the Yongbeu fabric market and that's where our site is located. It's very close and we can find a lot of uh, similar sites within the Dalton area. So I think together we can move some of the uh, the workers in the market into the uh, into our in the condominium or the designer in the condominium can ask the worker in the market to do the production. So it will revive this area by injecting this individual projects. So this is the exploded uh, isometric. You can see from the first floor, uh, this green part, the, the yellow part, the first three uh, levels are the street, uh, the street house. And in the middle, here, is the select shop for the young designer or the students just graduated from, from school, they can put their stuff here to sell. And two concept shops for the innovative. Uh, this is uh, a tiny author from Beijing. Uh, this is Xiao Yun Bu and uh, Yi Fan Zhang. And we have, um, here's, here's some projects uh, from our office. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Xijing Museum in Yunnan province of China. And this is Yunnan Stone Archive uh, in Beijing. And uh, uh, Sports Center for University in Beijing. Okay, this is the first time we address um, social issues as architects. And um, we got very excited to be invited by Zhou Wu. Um, We would like to look closely into the um, um, migrant workers in Beijing and their life and their work. This is the place that has a big fire broke out uh, last November, and after the fire, all the migrant workers got evicted based on um, 
fire safety issues. This is the, um, the area the related focus of the study on. It's a village called P, P village, and it's a village that the, the, uh, so, uh, the migrant, migrant workers, they actually have their own culture center, their own school, their own um, you know, other facilities. So you can see the consciousness of the workers actually start to wake up in this kind of scenario, and that's what we want to tackle on in our um, in our project. This is the, the gate for a peace village. These are the, um, all the exhibitions happen in Pea Village, the museum they build by themselves. And these are the, um, the library section in this village. These are actually a little um, production area, um, a, a little production workshop in the village. So after the eviction, a lot of artwork actually comes out to reflect upon the eviction and whether it's right or wrong and how does it impact the uh, social life of uh, modern China. Hmm. So as architects, I think we should act. We should, you know, try to imagine a new space for the workers to have them stay in the city and to give them um, a way for social mobility. So we would like to propose a heterotopia for the workers, and we work on um, four scales to tackle the issue. The first scale we work on is the interior scale. We generate all the furniture on the same floor matrix. So it would be the same floor, but based on the needs of the workers, the needs of the inhabitants, we have uh, different layouts for furniture to satisfy the, you know, the um, pragmatic needs of the living unit. And those are the, the floor plans. So this is the nano unit we call. The nano unit where the workers can stay. Usually in the traditional um, apartment layout, we have all the functional space layout horizontally. And in here, we have them stack up vertically. As the floor space um, folds and unfolds, it opens up different floor area, uh, different spaces for the units. And between the units, when, whereas the interior of the units address the uh, uh, pragmatic needs of, of living there, the exterior actually address the, uh, the cultural aspect of the community. So we have the in-between area there, the, the, where the white spots are, uh, are for uh, the communal space, the cultural space, where workers can do um, museum, library, and other um, institutional activities. And as we can see, it would be a very um, flexible space. It's pretty much like a, a multi-functional space, interior or exterior, where people can join the space spontaneously, and they can reinvent the, the culture and urban syntax. As we can see here, we are trying to tackle on the difference between um, the machine age and the age of the AI. So, as uh, in our understanding, in um, the machine age, we have Euclidean geometry as the base of um, design, at the base of geometry. But as in the AI age, we have chaos theory for the base for our mathematical base. So chance and chaos, probability, singularity are what we focus on in here. We bring back the density and the chaos. The density and chaos are actually the joy that we generate urban context. So as we can see in here, we allow chaos and the nano scale to come in to challenge what we have in the machine age. And this is the urban scale <coughs> design. We have the uh, 100 meter, um, you know, grid laid on top of the village, and then we have our nano scale, um, like super block or uh, super thin nano blocks or super thin nano towers in here. It's pretty much like the voice of that Jerry Deleuze talked about. We are building up the city from the bottom up. We are take out the 
social hierarchy to be a new order for the urban context. Thank you. Factories are disappearing, but then they will be replaced by new apartment buildings. 
while so many of these vacant houses are still around, uh, not to be utilized. Um, so our project site is uh, one of the former factory sites, uh, kind of right in the middle of these uh, housing and the factories. Uh, it's kind of like this, the very dense wooden houses, uh, and then within it you have used to be a kind of uh, old school factories uh, <coughs> owned by families. Uh, this is of course a very uh, generalized uh, image, but then uh, the factories used to go through many processes in producing a uh, product, uh, which was shared among the neighbors, uh, factories. Um, what we see as a potential with this new technology uh, that it can produce a lot of customized products, um, but then also the weight on the production process becomes more towards how do you come up with the idea, how do you come up with the, uh, the, the what to make more than uh, how to make. And, so we see more of the factory production uh, as that process more than just the act of producing. And we see that as something that we can overlap between housing and the factory, uh, if you consider that practice. And this is because as the singles come into the apartment, they stay inside their rooms, they don't associate. We think those are the precise same kind of programs that's missing for them is what's probably going to be important for the new uh, production process. Um, uh, I stress this kind of single population because uh, our site is also one of the highest rate of lonely death. Uh, it's basically because the singles are undiscovered uh, by any uh, relatives and uh, it becomes a very big issue. <laughs> Um, and so our project provides a kind of space. We, we made it design, and the design doesn't really matter actually, but in a way we made it obvious so that it kind of has a factory with spaces for production, but then they are more for the workers and the, the singles to kind of leave, uh, uses these spaces as way of talking or sharing ideas and so on. Um, and then, not only that it remains within the factory, but then the fact that these singles meet uh, the neighbors uh, who come there um, to, to share... Um, uh, I forgot to mention, but in this factory we said, okay, we're going to make a factory for um, building elements, like a staircase, windows, doors. Uh, these are the elements that we don't really focus so much, but I think with these production uh, possibilities, we can kind of say, pimp up your house, which you don't really think usually, but we think that house makers are kind of a bit too boring. Uh, we have empty houses, so let's pimp up the house with these kind of uh, technology. And by through that, the neighbors can come there to order something, they can discuss. The other factor, uh, the existing factory owners can come there and meet. Uh, and then allows uh, for such uh, interactions. If you look around the neighbors, there are some of the house factory units. Um, and because they can make things, they, they, they just kind of do things. I'm, I'm sure they are mostly illegal, but somehow they manage to do so. Um, and so we see it kind of as a potential. Uh, what if you actually design this? What if you actually allow for customized elements to be attached? Uh, and so that's the, that's the kind of elements. Uh, our proposal is to... We have our factory also customized with such things, uh, just almost as a showroom. Um, and then uh, what this factory produces can then be implemented into uh, vacant houses and neighbors around it. Uh, through which eventually if the vacant house becomes nice, then the singles who live there can eventually move out of this factory, move into these neighbors, uh, welcoming another kind of newcomers. Um, so that's it. Thank you.